is actually being sponsored for the refua of a woman that lives here in the neighborhood that just had a child in the 24th week. Did you hear about this? Yeah. What's the, you know the, I have the name down here. Do you know the full name? I don't know. A second. Toby actually sent me earlier today. Let me just make sure before I, I don't want to forget. Ah. Uh, 
Shalom. Crazy. Let's see here. So the learning that we're doing tonight, Bezat Hashem. Daniela, do you know her? Right, Debbie was the one that, yeah, Debbie and Sammy are actually the ones. Uh, here we go. Sarah and Me, uh, Noah Emuna Bat Sarah Chana. Noah Emuna Bat Sarah Chana. She'll have a refua. All right, so it's, um, it's very clear that I'm not sure it creeped up on you as well. Avram Avinu came and left way too fast. We already said goodbye to Avram Avinu this past Shabbos. I feel like he just came on the scene. Yitzchak shows up also, two Shabbatot ago. Already he's showing, we're going to say goodbye to him now. Yaakov Avinu, we have a lot more. But from the three of us, the one that's probably least understood and least spoken about is definitely Yitzchak Avinu. And every year during the parashiyot, where Yitzchak does show up, even if he's not the star of the parasha, for whatever that means, we try to do as much as we can to make sure that we're really mechavnim la'omek and to try to understand a little bit more about who Yitzchak Avinu, who are you? You know, Yitzchak's a very mysterious character. Of Weinberger used to always quote the tzaddikim saying, Yitzchak is Rashi Tevas. Yid, a Yid is a Tzaddik, a Chassid, and a Kaddosh. That's what he used to say about Yitzchak Avinu. Yid, Yud, Tzaddik, Chet, Chet Kuf. A Yid is a Tzaddik, Chassid, and a Kaddosh. Um, Yitzchak Avinu, the first, how old was he on the Akedah? What, it was 37? 37. 37. So, Yitzchak Avinu lives for many more years after the Akedah, but he's kind of in this place of an Olat Meimav, like this, here and not exactly here. He's kind of here, but he's not really exactly here. But it just means that from that which we do have about Yitzchak Avinu, it just means we, it means like there's enough in the little that we have about Yitzchak Avinu to teach us tremendous, tremendous, tremendous limudim regarding tachlis avodat Hashem b'fal. I would say that if there's one concept that never, ever, ever gets old to speak about, it's the concept of davening. Davening is the one thing, tefillah is the one place that just never seems to be like, okay, we covered that, you know. That one I have under my belt. Davening is the one thing that seems like it's, it's in constant hitchatshut mode, always renewing itself, and man and woman become renewed in its presence as well. The same exact thing, though, happens when we don't try to chaven to the omek of davening. It's not working. Why should I daven? It's not working. What exactly is supposed to be working with davening? What would you say? What, what is it? God does exactly what we want him to do. Right. Yeah, because you want to change God's mind. Yeah. Right. That, that always works the best, right? Yeah. Um, what, yeah. That is a costal mind. <laughs> we learned that many times. Mm-hmm. I put in something, it doesn't... I guess my kaltis is mekul kal. Yeah, I guess my... my uh, yeah, my, tick, my, my card is not working. What else is either like working or not working in our shallow concepts of tefillah. I'm feeling it. Am I in it or am I not? We've discussed this in a woman's class a few times the last few weeks. Am I feeling it or am I not feeling it? Well, tonight we're going to look at, we're going to, it's all a build-up towards the end. What Reb Shlomo is going to be teaching us tonight is something that I've been very, I've always been very scared to teach it. I taught it once, probably six years ago, and it was so... It was so intimidating. As we were learning it, I said, I can never go back to this piece again. So I hope that I'm not setting us all up you know, for complete confusion and failure tonight as well. But I think we have a chance. I think we have a chance with the preparation that we have before the actual text of Reb Shlomo to understand Koach HaTfila in the schus of Yitzchak and Rivka. You know, the Avot, each of them, the Avot and Imahot, each brought down not just a Shachras, Mincha, and Mariv. The location... For where they where they did institute and initiate the tefillah plays a very big role. Avram Avinu referring it to a mountain. Yitzchak Avinu, uh, sorry, yeah. Yitzchak Avinu referring to it as a sadeh, as a field. And Yaakov Avinu referring to the Makam Amigdash as, as a bayit, as a home. But it's not just that those three are different because one, it's like location is different. 
something about the way the Torah describes them davening makes each of their tefillahs, each of their ways of davening, something that each of us have to bring in. The way that they daven. For instance, Avram Avinu, what was he da- the first time he davens, what is he davening over? <laughs> He's davening over his dome, so there's enough to learn over this till, till, till eternity. But Avram Avinu's head, the davening of Avram Avinu is over his dome. Yitzhak Avinu, we find him davening. What is he davening over? A soulmate. Then where do we find Yitzchak Avinu davening again? To have a child. Ah, this Shabbos, the beginning of the parsha. Yaakov Avinu, where do we see him davening? He's making pleas with God. If you save me, and you know, He's making all these like taking tonight. I'm going to do this. This guarantors. Each of them are teaching us tremendous limudim, really important stuff. But we're going to go into the heart of tefillah for a few minutes and then end off, hopefully, with a, a beautiful and heavy teaching from Rib Shlomo on the tefillah from this parsha, parsha Toldot. There you go. Are there any... Can you pass me a cup? Very interesting. Very shocking, no? Yeah. Very shocking. <coughs> All right, so the first piece that we have in front of us is, is a very famous piece of Gemara that I'm sure many of you have learned. But we're just going to go over it to see where does Chazal feel about being stubborn Yidin, to be stubborn, an Akshan. So this is a Gemara in Masachet Brachot, Daf Lamed Bet Amud Bet. Amar Rabbi Chama Bar Chanina, Rabbi Chanina. Im ra'a adam sheitpalel velo na'ana, yachzor veitpalel. Person davens, and he feels or he sees that he's not been answered. Now, that usually means in our, if, if we're not davening for something specific, then it usually means if a person davens and he doesn't feel it, yachzol v'yitpalel, go and daven again. Shemeemar, and what is he based it on? This is the famous last pasuk from the David Hashem Ari Yishi, we said so many times in El and, 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 uh, and in Tishrei. Shemeemar, kaveel Hashem, go and daven to Hashem, chazak v'yamets limecha, strengthen and fill your heart with omits, with courage, v'kavel Hashem, and go and daven again. So because it says there in the beginning, kavel Hashem, if you don't feel it, gather yourself together again, get the courage to approach that thing which you want to daven over again, v'kavel Hashem. So really, what is the midah here that we're tuning into? Akshanut, stubbornness. How else would you explain it? Quite often, when we daven for something, and we don't feel it's answered, you know what the last thing we feel like doing is? Davening again. <laughs> it's a very interesting thing. It just shows how much, like, Mindy, what you said, the, you said the Kaspomat? It just shows how much, like, it really has become a Kaspomat, a bank card uh, industry, at least as, as much as we feel. Like, I davened with something. I cried so much for it. And then I didn't feel like it was answered. So if I really, really, really want, need this in my life, how could I not daven for it again? But what goes on in me that says, hey, I daven for it once, that must mean it's I'm not meant to have it. How many, now, obviously, one of the master prayers that we have is Maishu Rabbeinu. Maishu Rabbeinu davens how many times? To get into Eretz Yisrael? 515. 515 times. So do, can you imagine? Yeah, but Chazal say, if you had done it 516, Hashem would have said, okay, well, that... That's a mind-blowing thing. That, that just proves our point even more. That proves this Gemara even more. Kaveh Hashem, Chazak, Mitz Libecha, Vekaveh Hashem. Kama Pahamim, Chamesh Mot Vechamesh Asra. Right? Even Moshe Rabbeinu, after 515 times, Chazal is basically telling us, he kept on going back into his heart, finding Ya Mitz Libecha, courage. That's a very big, interesting, I'm not sure what that means even, to find courage of the heart. 
courageous. I, I'm still stuck on Wizard of Oz, one of the courage. Um, who was in the, who was the, the courage? Coward. Right. Courage, right? As opposed to coward, right? Courage. And then you go for it. We, we usually stop. We usually just stop. Next. Obviously, Hashem doesn't want me to have it. I don't know where that came. I don't know where it came from. So it depends on how you interpret "not not." Like answered meaning he does what I got him for, or he or I got or I got what I right. what I asked I for. I not even got what I asked, mm-hmm. but I felt like he was there with me. Okay. That, that, that could work, but usually it's more like if someone was sick and your davening isn't helping for them. So that usually you feel like your davening didn't help. That's usually what it is. Right. If someone doesn't have a child and you daven, they should give birth. Right? They should become pregnant. Right. And it's not working. That's the kind of pshat that we could deal with this mm-hmm. Gemara, right? Mm-hmm. Can anyone think of another example? Kol Adam velo Money? I mean, anything tangible, anything that you could say, like either it either happened or it didn't happen, mm-hmm. right? Now let me ask you, when was the last time anyone here davened that Mashiach should come? You did. Really when? Le- no, both. Like, like you stood there and say, today Mashiach needs to come. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, you're not asking. <laughs> you don't fall into the, the category of any of these questions. But it's like when Nate's in the room and I talk about like being a tzaddik and stuff. Like, no, it's, you know, it's not for him. But you, you, you hear what we're saying. That there's, there's somehow, I think I mentioned this last week somewhere and I forgot where, where I once met an old chassid and I asked him, I asked him, how are you going to feel? Or how are you going to feel now if I tell you that in your lifetime Mashiach's not going to come? So he said to me, I, I forgot this, I was going over some old notes last week because the Chaber from Simchat Shlomo asked me to send out an, because uh, every week they're getting someone else to write tires in their weekly emails. So I found this Rashima, I don't know, from like 12, 13 years ago. And um, apparently this Chassid had told me, I honestly wouldn't, it, it wouldn't make me change anything I did my whole life because if I believe that something that I'm doing is strengthening someone to the chain of Am Yisrael called Am Yisrael, that every ounce of effort is worth it. So that kind of a yid, kulam mispalo velo na'ana, by him, it's not about, his being answered is not necessarily that the whole thing happens, but it's that he's okay with feeling that something, that what he's doing is very, very important and concrete and, and monumental on some level. That's the first Gemara. You'll see how these things are going to add up. Now the second thing that we wanted to look at before we go into the topic of davening, there's something from Rav Kook. Well, at least, like, whenever we learn about Rav Kook in the Chagim, so there's this beautiful sefer called Mo'adei Re'a, yeah, you, you got it, Rav Neria's sefer and Rav Kook. Well, we've learned it many times here in other shi'un, where Rav Kook, the tzaddik, is speaking about, uh, when a story is describing him, uh, his anticipation, with how, he was, how he was with Chagim and holidays, what's amazing is it doesn't matter what the holiday is, when they talk about his davening in that holiday. And how the davening in that holiday was like no other davening all year long. Like whether it's Shavuos, whether it was Purim night, whether it was Leil Seder davening, whether it was Halal Simchas Torah, uh, Halal Anashana Rabbah, obviously. No matter what it was, he, he, there was something about Olam Atfila by him, which was just tremendous, tremendous, tremendous. But he's going to pick up on something that I mentioned before very fast, but we'll see if we can catch it, okay? So I'll pass, sorry, I passed the water again. Thank you so much. Shkach. Thank you. So Rav Kook says like this. This is from Olas Ria. This is Rav Kook's uh, uh, parish on the Siddur. Before someone davens, a person has to feel the need of the tefillah. I'm going to make you guys and girls work. What in the world does that mean? A person needs to feel the need of the tefillah. You didn't know what you're davening for. What happens if you find out that what you're davening for is not something that you need? Do you go on with it? Uh, my, initial, my initial thought is, is no. Then you have to change. Right, you have right. to 
you know, change your perspective on something else. It's, it's sending, beautiful. It's sending if you, uh, for better or for worse, if you're dominating for something and you achieve it, you know, if, if you're dominating for, you know, someone uh, to get well and they do, you don't say, good, I'm done. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm, you know, no. right. you, you're you going to figure out something else that you, you right. know, then need to dominate for. And on, on the contrary, you probably ha- have more of a feeling of, Wow, I accomplished it. Okay, you know, I, I'm gonna, you know, pick something else that I really Very want good. to happen. That's important because Very good. I, you know, I could do it. So that's one page with Stephen saying regarding the un- feeling the tzorich in the tefillah, in what you're davening for. What else could it possibly mean? So it's not repetitive. Meaning what? Oh, you're just saying the same things over and over again without. So you have to find the, the tzorich, meaning, what's the chiddush in what I'm about to say right now? Tasting the need of, why should I say this? I said this a few minutes, I, I said it. Well, you know when it's the hardest to do this? When you go to shuls that daven back-to-back mincha marivs. You know what I mean? When you go to a mincha that's at, you know, 4.30, and then you daven mariv at like 4.51, and you have to like go back-to-back mariv, mincha mariv, with wishbon and you're like, what do you mean? I just, slachlan, I just went through the whole thing. It's kabe shoifar and the a few minutes ago. Um, what what else could it mean? There's one more thing I'm trying to mechav into. Mm. There may be thousands of people davening for a certain... Right. This is beautiful. Beautiful. So deep. So deep. What you're saying is so real. Before I daven, maybe what Rav Cook says, I need to feel how much I need to daven. Not that davening needs to be said. But what it could be, I think this is, I don't know, I think this might be one of the explanations of what he's saying, and I think it's so beautiful. A person has to feel his need that without tefillah, ani lo kayam. Really what makes me exist and feel most alive is when I daven. So before someone davens, you have to feel how much you need to daven, not not, not chas v'chalil, a checklist Yiddish guy, but that you need, you need to feel alive. And therefore, you daven. You need to taste the davening. Ve'et ha'oneg shalat tefillah. And you need to feel the pleasure of the world of tefillah. Meaning you have to remind yourself that when you go tap into this dance called real davening, real davening, mm-hmm. right? When it goes way beyond a request and answer. That's what Rav Kook says. That's the, maybe that's what it explains when the, when the, when the Gemara says, when Mishnah says, that earlier pious Hasidim would spend an hour before. What was the hachana? The hachana was, let me remind myself how without Olam Atfila, Mani, Ma Chayai, what am I? And everyone knows, and I'm sure it's happened to each of you more than you probably can recount right now, but do you remember the times when you were mamish in davening? In, in it, in it. And when you were in, in it, it's not that nothing else mattered. It's that everything in the world mattered, but it was only becoming more and more meaningful and matter, mattering because you were so tapped in and you never wanted it to leave. And everyone knows that any Yom Kippur you ever experienced that was really there, you never wanted to leave. Yeah, besides, <laughs> just for me this year, I told you it happened with me with the B on Yom Kippur. Can you tell you, were you there? No, I'm, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you it's great. You know, mm-hmm. of course, you know. You, I got stung by being under my under my kippa, under my talis during the ila. So, and I was fly. I was like before that. I was really flying, and then and the chaver were flying, and each of my rosen even said to me, "I looked to you, and suddenly I saw you. You're going like this, and I'm thinking, oh my God, he's you're totally <laughs> wow. He's really tripping hard. Really, I was." Trying to figure out what in the world is going on with my head. Why do I feel like something's chirping me from the inside? I felt like something was eating me from inside my skull. <laughs> anyway, so. Oh, I mean. But imagine what that did to other people's dogs. I know, he said, and another guy also said, he said, wow, when you put up your hands and held your head, you held this all, so I'm thinking, <laughs> if you only knew, I couldn't figure out what in the world is going on with me. I was trying to. Big tikkunim, big tikkunim. So this is what Cook says that a preparation for tefillah is kind of reminding yourself, ah, I've been there, I've been there, I know what it's like, I know those places, I know that intimate place with the Rebbeinu Shlomo that 
Nothing has anything on it. No one has anything on it. And what an oinig that is. What a pleasure that is. So Rav Kook says, but then something very important. Look at the next line. En hatfila chafetza leshanot shum davar be'elokut. Davening is not meant to change anything when it comes to godliness. Don't spend a second trying to change God's mind. What's the problem with that? If someone's sick and you're davening that they should be healed, what are you doing? What are you doing? So, what does Rev. Cook mean when he says it's a very tricky thing? So what? You know who really solved this mystery for me? Yeah. You'd never believe it. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So <coughs> huh? The Rav. Rav Soloveitchik. Rav Soloveitchik says that when a person is davening and they're really in Olam Atfila, it's not that they changed the decree. It's that what? They themselves become a different person through Olam Atfila, so that the decree is not Shaykh on them anymore. Mm-hmm. The decree that they were, before they went into Olam Atfila, is Shaykh for the person before they went through a transformation. You're a different person. So the decree now is not Shaykh on you. But it doesn't have to do with how hard you asked. It, yeah. What if you're talking for somebody else? How does that happen? could be that in the schus of you transforming and becoming a deeper person, then the gzera that obviously affects you as well because you're in pain over that person's tsaras also changes. It's, like it's incredible. I, I feel like in that, if that's the way, we should be down for something to say. God, please do what you know is right. Mm-hmm. It should be our only Qu- Quite often that is. Or else we're like, if you want, please do it my way. But um, again, you're still focusing on requests. Olam Atfil is not just requests. Davening is not just asking. Davening is a transformation. Standing in the presence of Hashem. Not if you get it right. I mean, I'm just saying, stand, just, just, just being in... Just being, no, 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 no. Full concentration. I'm just saying, there's one thing called standing b'fnei ha-melech. Right? Just being in the presence of the king. That's one, God bless you. That's one thing. What are we just, now? What's the next thing? Bakashot, asking for things. Right? Think of the beginning of Shmona Esra. Tell me when there's a bakasha. Till when? When do we start asking for bakashot? When do we start asking for requests when it comes to Shmona Esra? Hmm? What do we begin with? Just tishbachot. Just just acknowledging the presence that we're in. It's just a matter of Ayn Dali Fne Miata Omed. Right? Like all those, you know. And it's not so much here, but in America, almost every single parochet or Aaron Kredish had either Dali Fne Miata Omed or Shivisi Hashem Lenegdi Zamid in front of you, right? So we see that just acknowledging the presence of where I am before where I'm standing is huge. That's before I even asked for anything. Do you know what could happen to a person when they realize in whose presence they're standing? Complete tshuva. Complete tshuva. You can truly become a transformed individual when you acknowledge the presence that you, Basa Vadam, a person that was made from what we were we made from, and where are we going to end up at Mevesrim, that you are standing before the King of Kings. Like basically that's what all of Hasidists try to instill within people to get them a little bit aware of before who you're standing. And how, how huge that ma'amad is. So that's, I think, more of what Rav, the Rav of Soloveitchik's words were, were mityaches to. That a person going through the transformation of davening, they become somebody else. They become somebody else, and therefore the gzardin, the decree that was on them, is not applicable to them anymore, because they are in a different place. It might be applicable to that guy that's still, but he's not there anymore. So, Rav, so now we can understand Rav Cook a bit better. You never want, you're never trying to change God's mind. What are you trying to do? 
You're, what are you trying to change? Yourself. Yourself. You're trying to change who, elements of your, your, your awareness in this world. And that's, that's beautiful. It's also much, much harder to approach davening now. Much, much... Oh, thank you. I was just holding the cup of that. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. So that's why Rav Cook says, like, and Rabbi David Aaron, I once heard him say, you really don't want to change God's mind, if you think about it. Like, that's not something you want to do if you really trust that Hashem, you know, that Hashem is your God. You don't want to change His mind. So what do you really want to do? You want to unify yourself with His mind, with His das, to the extent that you're able to. That only happens when a person's mavatling himself, emptying out himself as much to the greatest extent possible. Now, this is a very exalted high level in davening. Very, very, very much. I want to continue and speak more what the Baal Shem Tov is saying over here about a person's stat, state of mind in tefillah. <coughs> a very famous statement from the Baal Shem Tov. Baal Shem Tov says, Im ata achare ha kmo lefanea, im ken veshemait paralta. What a statement. Who wants to take the liberty of, of, of translating this in their own lashon? Kimmy, you could do it. You know, you, you, you got this down. If you're in the same place that you were after davening, that you were in before... What, 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 what do you mean, what place? A state of what? In the same state of mind. Right, of awareness of Hashem in your life. And what was the point of davening? And what was the point of... Tell this, to lit, this is what ticks off Litvox more than anything else in the world, right? Because <laughs> it's not that the Baal Shem Tov is saying, don't daven. He's just... He's just trying to put the emphasis on if nothing really changed by you and you have not transformed and all the same gzai dinim are still applicable to you because it's the same you, then what were you trying to do when you were davening? L'shem mait palalta. You were so loyal to your husband, it's unbelievable. You're still checking the box, right? Here. Absolutely. But the Baal Shem Tov is saying, if you're going to daven, why wouldn't you set this as a goal? That's really what is. Again, he's not saying don't daven. Chas v'shanam. God forbid. But what he's saying is, like, I always hear Shlomo's voice, like, if you're going to keep Shabbos, why don't you just let Shabbos be, keep you? If you're Meaning, if you're going to do it, why not go the whole way? Okay, so because you have to but you'll just be living a life of because I have to. Why not go to what it could do for you? And the Balsham is not saying that you don't get credit for it. You know, there's the, the checkbox. You know, it's not that you don't get Right, you might even get there, credit. There are definitely days after davening where I don't necessarily feel that anything's changed or that I don't remember saying any of the words of, you know, Shmon And But that's not the goal. This is this is Musar of this is how you should. Not, not necessarily that it's, you were asking about the, you know, this, you still get the mitzvah for it, the mitzvah for doing it, but that's not the goal of how you want to change yourself and how you want to not change yourself. Nachon, nachon. But again, if, he doesn't say if God is in the same place after you davened, then why did you daven? Because it, right? He could have said that. If you don't feel like God changed his mind, then what good did you davening to? That's the diuk here. He's saying if you are in the same place, thoughts about yourself, your, your loved ones, your friends, your surrounding, your keila. I always think about the inshul is a big test. Boy, is it a test. Mm -hmm. You're diving around the same people all the time, as much as you might love them, right? Do you feel the same exact thing about them after you dive? Like when you look around, is it the same exact thoughts you have about people? It's not just you. It's everything that's in your life. Do people have more value and meaning in your heart after you daven? You know what's interesting is that I'm feeling that happening more when learning happens. It's very weird. <coughs> Excuse me. I feel that what I just said right now is actually actually takes place much more when we're learning together. Yeah. Well, I think it's more of a test if that happens when you're davening together. I feel because when you're learning together and you're conversing and you're going back and forth, you're exchanging minds back and forth all the time. That you there's some kind of a fire that ends up like you're striking a match at the end of the at the end of the learning. With davening, because it's so personal, especially it's Shmonasri, 
Where's that, you know, what, what happened over there? But maybe, maybe not. It's just that's what I'm feeling right now. It could be I'm completely off and I'll feel completely different in the morning. Well, I don't know. Do you, like, I personally have a preference. Like, I, I'll call people there if somebody say, oh, you're coming to shul, you're coming to shul. I'm not such a shul go. I mean, I am, but I'm not being a dachanik. Right. I'm like, I want to daven with you. Ah. Okay? I'm, that vibe is very, very good for me. That's beautiful. You know, that? That's amazing. Don't I've never, like I've never called people someone. People you'd like to daven with? Yeah, and I actually, I, I'm davening with them now. Okay. <laughs> but what, what I, <laughs> no, what I, what I mean is, is that, even though I have that All Star team, how much of, of, of where they are in my heart changes after davening with them? I think that when I'm still stuck on like, did you answer my prayers or not? Then I don't have room for. What, what for their meaning, you know, their, the, the experience of being with them in my heart so much. Is that, is that, is that, is that just to me? Well, that means more your relationship with God. It's not your relationship with Right. God, the Maybe that's what it is. You're not paying attention to what they're doing and how they're dominating. Although you can't dive in without other people. It's very interesting. Right, but it doesn't mean that you have to pay attention to them. Right. Right. Ah, it's sorry. Is it also like all on, on me? Like, isn't it a gift also when you have a good feeling? It's not... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Usually when you prepare the most, and then it's really that much fire, you feel like it was all an undeserved gift. Mm-hmm. When you really could think it's all, look, oh, of course it worked. I, we, worked, at it. I worked at it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like as much as you work on a marriage, and then, it, and then things are going good, so the real, more real it is, the less you feel like, of course it's going good. Look how much effort I put into it. It's more like, wow, Shem, mm-hmm. you see, you see how much I'm working on myself, how much we're working on ourselves. That must be, you know, just and then you decide to give us a gift. At the end of the day, that's what's gonna feel like when Mashiach comes. I think. What do I know? I don't know. Anyway, now look at the next. This is all preparing us to the end. Look at this next thing. This is amazing. This is one of my favorite gemaras due to a Torah that I once heard from my brother many years ago, and I, he said it again last week in Toronto. It was a, we were together in Toronto for Shabbos. This is, a, this is amazing. The Gemara says in Baba Kama, Kola mevakesh rechamim al chabero. Maybe, maybe we learned this before, this, this line. Anyone who asks for rachmim for his friend. Vehu tzarich leoto davar, hu ne'anat chila. This Torah is amazing, right? Remember this Torah? So bad because I was dying for the same people. I'm still dying for to get married. Still. Till today. And I was like, really? Really? You sent me him? I wasn't looking for Baruch Hashem. I wasn't looking for him. I was dying for my friend. Right. So the pshat, this pshat of this gemara is like this. What does it sound like? Usually, the lashon we usually use is not the source. This is the source. People usually say, "Kol amispalo bad chaveiro na natchila." That. If you dive in for someone else, you're answered first. But that seems like such a shallow, tricky game. Like, oh, so what do I need? I need, I need money. So what do I do? <laughs> Hashem, please give him, right? That's a, come on. That's like, it, it can't, that, that, that consciously can't be the pshat. That'd be, that's too, it's too easy, right? So obviously, so what, is, so what does it mean? Look, look inside the Lashem. Anyone that asks Rahman is for his friend means that Hashem should open the gates for someone else. Now, this is where it gets interesting. What does that mean? Vehu, meaning the person that's davening. He needs the same thing. What does he need? Maybe. Maybe. Look, look, listen to the Lashon. It's from the it's from the Bredich of his parish. I have for you. Huh? You daven for him, you daven for you. Could be that's one thing. He's saying something. The Bredich of his says a crazy title. Listen to this. Kol mevakesh achim al chaveru. I'm davening for my friend because he mamish needs parnasa. Vehu tzarich leoto adavar. And I need him to have parnasa. Then, then, 
you're answered. Meaning, what are you answered? Not that you get what you daven for him to have. You get your tefillah answered, which is what? That he, that he gets it. Now, that's going to prepare... Do you hear how deep that... Do you understand this? This is, this is mind-bogglingly deep. I want to say it again just to make sure we understand this. A person is looking for his shidduch. It could be that you need your shidduch or not. I think that's secondary here. Mm-hmm. What, what the point is here is, Rebona Shleilam, just like I need food in order to feel sustained, I need that broken heart to be healed and fixed. I need it. It's something I need. I need him or her to have what they are crying for. Those are the kind of tefillahs that completely shake heaven and earth. Very good. Yeah, yeah. The, the real ashirut is when I'm, I'm, I'm basking in the in the in someone else's wealth. I am that I I'm happy in his lot. But this is like now we're taking davening to like, it's like you know, so this is already. This vart is amazing. Amazing. So, what are you really trying to do when you daven? Based on this last thing. What are you really trying to do when you're davening? Are you tra- you're, not trying to, you're, trying, you're not trying to change Hashem's mind. Like based on everything we learned right now. You're not trying to change Hashem's mind. You're not trying to really ask for things in order to get it. All you're trying to do is to become an individual, a refined individual, who's worthy and clean in order for Hashem's bracha to settle in you. That's all it is. No, you, you say it. <laughs> Who wants to give it a crack? What I, if, unless no one understood what I just said. But I think the last line is like, my, the, the, I dive into Hashem, not necessarily to have things, but I dive into Hashem that if you're going to, that I should be someone who's worthy and clean enough inside from the me, 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 that I should be a Mishkan where Hashem's divine presence can dwell in the form of brachas. But it's not about what I need, it's about what Hashem wants. Because do you know what you become when you do that? Do you know who you become when you're, in, when you're actively in that state of mind? Do you know what kind of a person you become when you can reach a place? I mean, a good one? I, you, you become one of God's dreams. Except you know? the answer isn't answered the way you want it to. Or right, the way you want or it. Or if God's not ready to give that answer. You right. Know. Here it's asking for right? the yeah. or for the other person. It's not asking for a cure or for panasa. It's asking for rachamim that whatever ha- that person has to go through, shashem rachem alav while he's going through it. Right. And then you immediately get that sense of rachamim, which is why you get it first. Mm-hmm. So you're saying when it's not something specific, then it could work. That's why the people misquote this Gemara really badly, because people always say, Hamit palel ba'ad chavero, na'anat chila. But really, what he, I mean, it's very nice what you're saying. But the diuk is asking for rachmim. talk about this a lot with, with groups, that yeah. uh, where there are the mitzukah, and like, you know, to, especially with Haredi groups, where they teach their children to daven for Bubby that she's going to be okay, and right. what happens to their emunah, that right. Bubby's not so okay. Right. Um, and so what do you teach them to that? Well, you could teach them, can you become someone that needs your bubby to be okay like you would need to eat right now? Mm-hmm. No, you can't. I'm saying that. I don't think you can. But you can this is for Hashem to be with bubby while she's struggling. Right. Yeah, yeah, better. Better. That's Rachamim. And then a three-year-old kid can do. Yeah, that's Rachamim. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think. I think so. Okay, so all this was preparing us for the bottom. And just because the bottom is in English, it does not mean it's going to be easy. It'll probably be much harder than the even Rav Cook's Hebrew that we had before in Alatari. Yeah. Very, very difficult. Rav Shlomo says like this. This is actually, a version of this was put in Evan Shlomo and told it. 
I don't have a. What time? Are you okay? What time is it? We have time, right? Yeah. 8:47. Okay, great. Look what Rabbi says. Okay. <laughs> we learned something awesome from the Rabshitzer. The Rabshitzer, Reb Naftali of Rabshitz. Reb Naftali of Rabshitz was one of the top students of the Chose of Lublin, of the Seer of Lublin. He has a sefer called Zera Kodesh. It's actually one of the two names, two of the six names that Leah Golem gave her her son Ohev. Uh, Leah Michal, Al Vashon, named the son Aaron Yechazkel, Ohev Yisrael, Zera Kodesh. It's got six names. They call him Ohev, right? Out of, you know, out of all the six. Oh, it was a dear, a dear friend. We share the same birthday, just a year apart. Um, so they, they were very much into the Rabshitz here. The Zerah Kodesh is the name of his Sefer. Let's look at Rib Shlomo says. When Yitzchak was praying for children, it says the most beautiful thing, Vayater, or Vayeaser, it depends on you say, Vayater lo Hashem. Vayater, what uses, it uses the word Vayater uh, when it comes to Davin. It doesn't say Vayit Palel, or, it says Vayater lo. The shallow translation is, and God answered him. But why shouldn't God answer him? Yitzchak Avinu is praying and God shouldn't answer? Like, what's the big chiddush here that Hashem answered him? Obviously, you know, you have like Yitzchak Avinu is coming down from the, like we said before, how old is Yitzchak over here when he, when he, when he, when he has a child? Be'erich? How, how old is, <clears throat> I mean, not Be'erich, the Torah tells us exactly. Let's go a little bit, huh? He's 40 when he gets married. He's 60, He's 60 for 20 years, Rivka's barren. Yeah. That's okay, remember, she was three. So, so, you know, no, according to the calculations in the Midrash, so she was 23 when she, when she had the kids, and he was 60. Right? Because she was three by the story last Shabbos by the well. Which we, we, we once had a whole shear on that. How could she have been three? But it's, it, it was an amazing shear, but not, not for now. So, the Rav Shetzer says something so strong. Vayi'ateh lo Hashem. Yitzchak's praying for children was so strong that even God began praying that Yitzchak should have children. Vayi'ateh lo Hashem. He made God pray. Now, wait a second. What? 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 <laughs> What does that mean, even? What's the shorish of that word? Atar, ayin, ayin, tafresh, la'anot. I think so. Like, ta, 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 rip, right? Atar, uh, Esti, you know this. It's like when you have a... It's appeal. It's, a, appeal. it's an appeal, right. It's an appeal. It's like his answer was appealed positively, but it also uses the lashon of his davening as appealing to Hashem. It was back and forth, this language of la'ator, ha'atiru <coughs> ba'adi, <coughs> Excuse me, but this chiddush here is very, very, very bizarre. What does it mean that you actually make Hashem pray? What does that mean? Can we can we can we kind of explain that a little bit? Praying isn't praying just something that we do from God, and it either works or it doesn't. What does it mean to cause Hashem to pray? What's that? And who does Hashem pray to? Right, and who does Hashem pray to? <laughs> the way we normally talk about it is we're praying to God. So. Right. It's some reading taught us that Hashem puts on tefillin and Hashem cries for us. Right. And not that I understand any of it, but it's all in the same package of... We all understand certain... what that means, exactly what that means. It's just you that doesn't understand what, what it means that Hashem puts on tefillin. Yeah. No, no, I, I'm, I'm just messing with you. Yeah, yeah. What's that? Yearning. Yearning that what? Who is he yearning for? And by uh, put it in, put it in. What does it mean that God yearns? Maybe it means, maybe, that you get a taste that Hashem wants you to have it. What you're asking for. It, I like what you're saying about yearning. It could be that this Pasuk means that Hashem let Yitzchak know, not only am I going to grant you what you're asking for, I'm not doing it only because you want this to happen. I want to give this to you because it's something that I want to happen. That's what, that's why I, I, we brought the Gemara before. 
your kiviyachol, when tefillah is so real, then you can even somehow bring Hashem, to, that it should be revealed to you, because not, that, not that you bring change Hashem, you don't change Hashem's mind ever, but what becomes revealed to you, when the tefillah is that refined and pure, Hashem lets you know, you know, I, I want you to have this as well. Now what happens to a person who receives something feeling that? <coughs> what, kind of a light, what kind of a meaning does that which you davened over now take place in you? That it wasn't just that Hashem said yes, but that something about it was revealed to you, that you hear Hashem saying, I, I've been, I also really want you to have this. I'm so glad you've been davening over this. Right? Look, I don't expect any of you to get this because I don't understand it at all. It just, it makes sense in some mu- you know, much deeper sphere that I can't articulate in, into words. But if I had to try to think of an example of Hashem saying, I wanted you to have this. So the deepest I can get is Dafka with my children, but it's, but it's not so Meduyak because I never dreamed that I would have the kids that I have. I never even dared have the chutzpah to ask that I, that I could have the kids that I have. It's not like I have what I have because we dive in so hard for these beautiful kids. And now, and, and, and Hashem said, by the way, I wanted you to have this also, right? So with my children, I, this, this parable, this analogy only goes so far because I never, ever, ever, ever had the chutzpah to dream this, this big. Now, I don't know about Bina. I know I didn't. I definitely didn't. So it's got to be with um, something else that you can hear Hashem saying to you somehow, I also want you to have this that you're davening for. I, I don't know what that is. I don't know if, I don't know if it's even, this is Yitzchak Avinu Tefillah. So I like very much what you're saying because he made God pray. That, that, that means more like he made God reveal to you that this is something that Hashem was rooting for as well to happen. And when that happens in Yitzfila, this is another world. It takes davening to a completely different place. That you can get a sense that that which you're experiencing is not just a gift, but it's Hashem saying, this is what I really want you to be feeling, this closeness. That's, that's just divine. That's just divine. Let's, let's, we're either going to get more confused or get more peace, but it's worth a shot anyway right now, right? Imagine my baby asks me to give them something. So if I've loved them a little bit, I just give them what they asked for. If I love them the most, I want them to have it as much as they want to have it. For instance, when was the last time you really wanted your children to have the sweets that they're asking for? So what usually tells us, like what usually stops us from wanting our children to have that which they want? Because usually what they want, we don't think it's so good for them. But forget about what they're getting. Think about how much they want something. Did you ever want your child to have something as much as they want to have it? Ask it again. Did you ever ever want your child, did you ever end up wanting your child to have what they're asking for as much as they're wanting what they're asking for? Wait, 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 wait. wait. Uh, Rega, that's easy. That's easy. For them to find a zivug, that's easy. No, that's too easy. Of course, I'm talking about when, when, it's, when it's not exactly something. You're five in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it, could, it could be after 13 hours of sleep at 11 a.m., but it's a lollipop and not a cucumber, right? <laughs> Let's just say for a second, right? So whatever the example is, but when they're older and it's about a zivug, did you ever want your child to find their zivug as much as they wanted to find it? I think you probably wanted it more than they wanted to have it sometimes. That that's, happens quite often with people. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about dafka, something that you just, they want it so badly, right? And you don't want it be- for them because of other reasons, but it ends up being about their son. So when you cave and you give them the lollipop, did you ever want them to have it as much as they wanted? So 
What I just think about is when my kids were little, and um, if they were crying in the middle of the night and I had no desire to get out of bed, and then I would get out of bed because I had no choice and mm -hmm. hold them, and I wanted to help at least as much as they did mm -hmm. to just hold them. Mm -hmm. But it took a That's long beautiful. Time. No, that's actually... <laughs> Like they want you to hold them, right? That's very good. They want you so badly to hold them, and to meet their ratzon, you really have to. You got to work on yourself very, very deep to go against your teva. I'm speaking as a man right now. <laughs> I'm definitely speaking as a husband, right? That's so easy for me to talk like this as well, right? So obviously, like that's you know, there, there's levels to this as well, but that moment that you want them to call out to you and they want you to be the one that answers them? Is there anything greater than that in this world? So, with the Rebona Shleilam, it works the same way. When, there, when we go and look for every other source of help to help us with what our problems are, but then we end up turning to Kaddish Baruch Hu and saying, who are we kidding? So at that moment... There's such a oneness and a meeting of ways at the same place that you can't even describe it. That's what happens, essentially, in the peak of Olam HaTfilah. I don't go anywhere for my, for my comfort, my, my help, my guidance, and Hashem's not going to anybody else right now, at least as much as I could feel it. I feel like He's coming only to me. Only to me. So it's not exactly what he's saying over here, but that's okay. We're making our own Torah Shabbat Peh from this. I'm going to read this paragraph again. Imagine my baby asks me to give them something. If I love them a little bit, I just give them what they asked for. If I love them the most, I want them to have it as much as they want to have it. You see what it is? It's not that I'm just giving it to my baby. My baby's wanting it is so deep that I want her to have it. Suddenly, I take over her praying. Okay, this is going to help us. That, la that, last, that last five, six words. Suddenly, I take over her praying. Yeah. It sounds to me like I'm an identification. I mean, you can do it easier with speech. Okay. Okay. I mean, just a silly example that maybe we can all get, because we're all from the States originally, yes? Okay, so we all, when we were kids, we had X candy. Okay, and all of a sudden your kid sees that somebody has one, and they want it. Right. And if we give it to them, even though it's bad for them, we know it's bad for them, but we know the delight that we had when we had it at their age. Right. That's a complete identification. Uh huh. I think that's the only way we can deal with Hashem is on that level, that we think that Hashem is identifying with us. Uh huh. And as our children, he, we hope He is. That's pretty far out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You don't, you don't realize how trippy you just sounded. <laughs> <laughs> Only in this room right now. <laughs> Let's see, that, that's chazak me'od, Lindy. Oh. Yeah. I, I brought it down to a candy bar level. Because we have to, what do you mean? Yeah, but how, no, that's what it, because... Yeah, which one? Tortilla. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was oh. thinking of Shuvu Elayim. Uh-huh. Shuvu Elayim. Uh -huh. Shuvu Elayim. Uh -huh. <laughs> Come back to me, and I'll come back to you. Like it's the Yitchabut, I think. Yeah. That's, I'm feeling like that's the whole thing. That but then once you start doing tshuva, you see, when you're, when you're standing from far, you can't hear Hashem saying, I want you to come close to me. You feel more, I'm supposed to be, I should be coming close to you. The closer you get in tefillah without asking specific things, the more you can hear it's like the more you can hear, oh, Hashem has been saying, you know, you, you like you feel that finger come saying more, 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 more. Do you see here what Yitzchak is showing us? Yitzchak brought down into the world that God's answer to my prayer for children is not just that I'm asking God for children and He says, okay, I'll send them some orders for the merchandise. It mamish becomes God's prayer. Again, we can't understand. It's not God's prayer to that now Hashem is praying to Hashem. I think a better word that we could have used here is that it becomes God's ratzon. 
or it becomes revealed to you, not that it becomes God's Ratzon, you can't change God's Ratzon, but perhaps that it becomes revealed to you that this is what Hashem wants you to have. And that's how you know if it's Kedai to keep on davening for something. Why, that's how you know maybe if it's Kedai to continue being an action. If you can hear that, no, 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 I'm telling you, this is really what Hashem wants it to be. And you can only know more and more what the Ratzon of Hashem is when you yourself become cleaner and cleaner inside, 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 which is something that happens to a person when they acknowledge the presence of Hashem in their life. Okay. Have you ever asked someone for a favor, and after they do me the favor, we're not such good friends anymore? I walk away from it, and I say, thank you very much. I'm very thankful, but nothing happens afterwards. And then sometimes I ask someone for a favor, and we become so close. What's the difference? If I ask them for a favor and they say, okay, I'll give it to you, it's a one-time act. But if this person answers back, I want you to have what you're asking for as much as you yourself want to have it. Okay, I don't know, a friend like that, that'd be amazing. <laughs> Can you drive me to the airport? I, no pressure, I'm just saying. Yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> I do need to actually talk to that tomorrow night, but I want, all right. Can you drive me to the airport? You know something? I want you to I want to I want to drive you to the airport just as much as you want to go to there as you need to go to the airport. So this is already But maybe you have an agenda. No agenda. No agenda. No agenda. It's nothing about them. They're privileged to be the ones to do it for you. It's a privilege. Right. Right. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. It's selfless chesed, you know why? Because that person that's part of a round of 25 people, giving the, they don't really think, unless they're going to put everything into that meal, that their meal is going to stand out more than others and it's going to become about them. It's being part of a circle of chesed, a selfless circle of chesed, which mamish. People ask me a lot about Efrat, wherever I go. Wherever I go, it's not just with chesed. It's, with, it's, it's not just with chesed with women that are in... Uh, it's, it's an unbelievable arivut that goes on around here. When people are in times of need here, I mean, look, as a rabbi, you get to see the most ugly sides of people and the most divine sides of people as well. What goes around here when people are in need of tzedakah? It's, it's out of this world. It's, it's unbelievable. But here he's talking about, like, the high... He's talking about the, the, the ultimate place of... I want you to have what you're asking for as much as you yourself want to have it. Suddenly my soul and the other person's soul becomes one. You can ask me for a glass of water and suddenly I truly want you to have a glass of water in the strongest way. And when this happens, I taste the depths of your soul and then we're friends forever. You see, he's giving the easiest example. He's not talking about, I want you to be rich... It, this kind of level of connection can happen from just like, I mean, like you, you, you pulled your, you realize before I just, I was just holding my cup and my subconscious was probably thirsty. You wanted it right away. I'd like, rather have it. <laughs> and that's why, <laughs> and that's why you did it. See, like, so, so let's like try to bring this down for a second because we learned a lot of different, we just, we learned a lot of different levels here and, and. It's a big binyan over here of prayer, but if you were asked, what was Yitzchak's chiddush with Olam Hatfila? So you could say, well, look how well, look at the words that the Torah chooses to describe his relationship with Hashem when it comes to davening. What does it say? Vayater lo Hashem. It doesn't mean that God gave in to him. It means that God was also appealing on his behalf that it should happen. But it wasn't that God was appealing on his behalf to someone else. It was letting Yitzchak know, I want you to have this too. I want, and the closer you get to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, through the awareness of standing before the king, the more that you're more sensitive to hearing Hashem saying what Rav Kook said. You have to, you have to figure out, let's tzorech hatfila. Like, I want you to have this, or maybe you'll hear, I don't want you to have it, but that's a biru that Rav Kook says a person should do before they start davening for something. 
how do I know if I should do this job? Is it good for me? Is it not good for me? Right? We always have those questions. How should I move there? Should I not move there? Well, when you go into the Olam HaTefillah and you really, really nullify yourself before HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and you really go into your heart and you remind yourself, this is not about a question and, and, and answer session here. This is not a kaspamat session of putting in a bank card and trying to get money, but it's something much bigger than this. And the more that that becomes your approach to davening, your approach to Olam HaTefillah, the more that you can be in tune with the Ratzon Hashem. And there, therefore, like if you go back to the page before, let's go back to what Rav Kook says, Lifnei HaTefillah, Tzarich Le'agish Tatzorich Shel HaTefillah. Maybe it could be that before you daven, if it's davening is what we've been describing over here, Efshar Le'agish Tatzorich Shel HaTefillah. I can maybe even hear before I start davening, does Hashem want me to have this or not? And if I feel like maybe Hashem doesn't want me to daven for it, I doesn't want me to have it, then why would I keep on davening for something that I haven't gotten until now? Maybe Hashem doesn't want me to have either. It must be that Hashem knows much better for me. Hashem knows my interest, what's better, my best interest, much better than I do. And Yitzchak Avinu heard through his davening, through his infinite world of tefillah, of going to that place of mamish malach alaretz kevodah, Yitzchak Avinu hear, heard at a certain point his chiddush was, you can hear Hashem saying, I'm letting you know, I want you to have this. And maybe that's how we can understand what the Rav Shetzer Rebbe was saying. This is what happens to a person. This is what Yitzchak brought down into the world. Now it's true. There's not a lot written about Yitzchak in Olam HaTefillah. Not so much. There's not a lot written about Yitzchak at all. But are you kidding me? If this is all I ever had from Yitzchak, I could live off this like my whole life. I can live off of this understanding of engaging in prayer for the rest of my life if this is the only thing I knew about Yitzhak Avinu. You know? Again, Yitzhak Avinu is someone that... <laughs> I mean, we didn't even say anything. You don't think Yitzhak Avinu was davening when he was on the Akeda? <laughs> Shlomo talks about this a lot. You don't think he was davening while he was walking up with Avram Avinu? You know, from like here... Right? Could have been from right here, this Mirpesa, this big. You could see the place from far, right? Although I know so many Ephrations that hold that their backyard is the place where Yitzchak and uh, Avram looked at the place from afar because there's so many spots here that you could see. Um, when I was here the first time, like 25 years ago, my friend Baruch Sturman told me, he said, you see from right here? Then they built a frat more and more closer to that area and then so many more spots that that could be as well, right? This, what do we know? We, all we know is that Yitzchak Avinu opens up the gates for us to connect to Hashem in a very important way in Olam HaTefillah. And I think that everything we did with the Rav, with the two Gmaras that we saw, with Rav Yitzchak with, with Rav Kuk, with Baal Shem Tov, all bring us to this place of what's definitely is that davening is not about um, seeing if it works or not, which is how we started this year. That's not what it is. Now, where's the biggest game here? What's the biggest question here? How do we walk into every high school tomorrow in Efrat and talk to children like this about approaching davening? And how do we talk about this without every parent that lives here looking like that and responding like that? So it starts with our shul. It, just, it starts with wherever you are. Right? Ba'asher Hashem. Huh? I don't know how. <laughs> I'm not sure how, but I think so. I think that through the Chovas of the of the Piyasetzner, I think that that's the gateway to get into the heart of the kid, to be open to understanding that whatever he was told until now in the shallowness is much deeper. Much deeper. I don't want to say wrong, but much deeper. Much, much, much deeper. I think it is. I think it is. You know, I, I, I could just tell you that when I first started Mamish davening, it had nothing to do with words. It, it was in fact when I stopped davening for a few months when I was a teenager, the words, and then I'd go to shul and I, lear, and I started hearing Reb Shlomo's Nusach. I, didn't, I, I remember going to shul, I didn't ask for anything. 
And then I started feeling like this is this something called davening. Then, then the pasuk that was on our own kodesh made sense to me. Dalif talmed. It was so much more than what I'm. I didn't. I, I had not. I had a million things to every teenager. Come on, there was the girl, of course, that was breaking my heart. I could have asked Hashem for you know, or or whatever it is, the sneakers or the basketball team or a- anything. And yet, something I'll, I'll never forget. Like that moment is etched in my in my life forever. And okay, so I'm 13, 14, then 15, but younger, I think it's. I think it is. I just. I'm not just. I'm not sure how. We need a lot of friends to help us figure out how to how to create that. You know, because it has to be. We can't afford not to. We can't afford not That's the, see, when I, when I look at it like I said, that... I said, we can't afford not to. I had some very, very poor experiences with Tefillah growing up. And I'm very, very fortunate and happy where I am. But I, I just... I don't, I, don't have, I don't have any of the answers. But the way that it typically has gone through... Um, I, mean, yeah. I can't talk much about the... You know, the, the system here, but in the modern Orthodox you know, system in America, it's just tefillah is a non-factor. And it's it's not only modern Orthodox. That's the thing is that it's not just in that in that world. It's it's really, you know, it's it's across the board. And I feel like our geula is dependent on our approach to davening. And I think that each of the avot really give us, and the imahot. Of course, they're giving us all the tools that we need to retrain ourselves to understand what is the purpose of acknowledging that you're standing before Hashem. You know, usually, like it says, it says, "En Mashiach ba ela behesachadat." The Gemara says, "Mashiach only comes when you have a hesachadat, which means uh, you get distracted." Something it always drove me nuts that that statement. You get distracted from what? You get distracted from is it working? Once you get distracted from that concept, is it working or not? Then maybe, you know, then maybe, you know. I don't know, but it just seems to me that, that that's what that Gemara probably means. And Mashiach ba'ela b'shachadat, that you become distracted from that game of, is, is it working or not? Is it working or not? Um, but again, these are, these are concepts that I'm asking everyone that's learning with us here and online if anyone has any any special you know approach that they've seen work with their children, well, I guess forget their children that they see work first on themselves and then with their children regarding the approach to davening like this of a Yitzchak Avinu davening. Let's see what we can come up with because I agree with you. We we can't not we can't afford to not try to go in that place. Now before before I went upstairs to check on on my oldest. So um, I see her. She was on the floor, and she was had a she had a, a she didn't know I was in the room, and she was holding something and going like this. So I said, I said, Tifer, what's going on? She's like, oh, but there was a bencher under my bed. Oh my it's a bencher under my bed. Can children connect to this? Yes. Well, yeah. It doesn't matter. I don't care what the reason is, you know. I don't know what. Look, I told you the most depressing day of my life was the day that she came home and told us a bracha. That she learned elsewhere. That she learned elsewhere. It drove me nuts. And it's like, oh, it's about me? It was about her, you know? That's a chadat. And that happens. Minty, you wanted to say something. I'm sorry. Uh, it brings me back to the concept of the all star team. Okay? Yeah. I'm with yeah. any one of my gangs. We're going to, you know, like when we daven over the summer when we do uh, RV. It's a very, very big RV. Because everybody loves everybody in that room. And and we're focusing on each other. And Hashem. Yeah. There's, there's a, I'm, I'm, yeah. Not, I'm not expressing this. No, no, no. I understand you. I understand you. And then, and then it happens both in davening and in learning. Yeah. I worked for a lot of years yeah. in the uh, Ramah programs, which is conservative programs. And when we would talk about how to help the kids learn how to connect with God, there was always somebody who would say, we need a lake. A lake. A lake. Because you're too young, but for those of us who went to camp in America, there was always a lake that you dive into Kabbalah I'm not too young, I'm just on the West Coast. We didn't have any of us to go in the East Coast. Oh, I had a lake. 
temple or whatever. Uh -huh. Anyway, <clears throat> the idea was that Kabbalah Shabbat was at the lake, and it was the highest davening because it was music and because there was a, a, a Dvar Torah that they could understand what was going on and because they had counselors that loved what they were doing and, and it was a whole combination of, of factors so that everybody could find a place that they could mm -hmm. it was being together with Yochever and the smell of the white shoe polish and but seriously there's a whole thing and I, I just find with my grandchildren that if they see me davening and if I'm like if I'm at home and I'm davening and I'm singing a little bit that's all I feel like I need to do mm -hmm. for them to, you know. Takes much less than we think. Why we went, I think, on this tangent is that so many parents recently have been asking me to talk to their kids about tefillah. But I don't think that they would want me to talk to their kids about tefillah if they knew what I was going to say to them. find yourself davening over what? What are you davening over? You're davening over the presence of the, of the moment that you're in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or before you learn to stick with you while, while you're in shir. And that's why you know, kids should have, should, there should be instruments in every high school today before they start davening. To give, if the institutions or parents want, to have, want the kids to have a chance that davening could be something, there has to be. Because that talks, that'll, that'll talk to children, even the ones that are completely tone deaf and least musical, will talk to them so much more, so much more. Mm. Yeah. Maybe that's a start. I don't know. Yeah, but he has to go to Princeton, so we have to finish. <laughs> exactly. Aye, we're on our, we're not here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, shkoyach, everyone. Thank you so much.